mercy and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Throughout this season of Epiphany, which is the season that we're in right now, after the Christmas season, when Christ is revealing himself more and more, we've been looking at the theme of being one body in Christ, a theme introduced by Paul in 1 Corinthians and in Romans, that we are all one body together, but every body needs many different parts, many different members. The different members have different functions, not all of them as glorious as others, and yet we rely on each. And we've looked at ways that we, as the body of Christ, need those who are young or even less mature. We also looked last week at the way that we, as the body of Christ, need those who are elders, those who are more mature, and the ways that we, as individuals, should seek to be both childlike in some ways and mature in others. Now, if we're talking about bodies, I think there's one thing that everybody can agree on, whether we're talking about a spiritual body or a physical body, that we don't want in our bodies, and that is weakness. In our bodies, we want no kind of weakness. Weak describing any part of what our bodies do is generally going to be a bad thing, whether it's a weak immune system or a weak digestion, a weak memory, weak eyesight. If we go to those things that our bodies are used to do, maybe a weak sense of responsibility, weak relationships, weak communication skills, or those things we maybe think of more in terms of strength and weakness, we don't want weak bones, we don't want weak muscles, we don't want weak anything. And of course, Christ wouldn't want anything weak in his body either, would he? Or would he? If we look at today's passage, we'll see that just like so many topics, Christ brings a much different perspective to the topic of strength and weakness than the one that we would naturally have, just in our own thoughts and understanding, and the one, the message that we're sent by our world and by our culture. For instance, taking a look at Luke chapter 6, which I just read, but reminding you of some of the things that we read, Jesus made two different lists. He talked about the people who were blessed because they were rich and full and because they could laugh now and because all people spoke well of them. And he talked about the people who were being punished because they were poor and hungry and weeping and hated and reviled and spurned. Right? Wrong. Flip those lists. Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, you who are hungry, you who weep. Blessed are you when people hate you and exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil. All things that we try pretty hard in our lives to avoid. How many of you, when trying to plan for the future, say, what's the best way to make sure that I'm going to end up poor and hungry? Anybody? No, we do the opposite, right? We want to make sure that we end up on the list that says rich and full, with minds at ease so that we can laugh now and with reputations such that all speak well of us. We want to be strong, well-fed, well-regarded, and well-satisfied. And yet Jesus says, woe to those who are those things that we spend so much time trying to become. He says, blessed instead are those who are those things we spend so much time trying to avoid. Blessed are those who are poor, hungry, those who weep now, those who are hated, excluded, reviled, or spurned. Why? Why on earth would God be saying, through Jesus, because Jesus is God, why would Jesus be saying, these are the signs of blessing? Blessed are you when you're at your weakest. Blessed are you when you're at your most broken. Blessed are you when you're at your most desperate. Why would he be saying that? Doesn't he want his body to be strong? Doesn't he want each of us as members of his body to be strong? Why would he be praising those who are weak? Why would he be warning those who are joyful and well-fed and well-spoken of? The answer actually lies in words that were spoken almost 600 years before Jesus. The answer lies in part in Jeremiah chapter 17, which we also read today. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes his flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. 
For he is like a shrub in the desert. He shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when he comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Cursed is the one who trusts in themselves. Blessed are those who trust in God. Now Jesus lists start to make a little more sense. Because which person is more likely to fall to this curse of self-reliance? The person who is strong, well-fed, satisfied, and well-spoken of? <coughs> or the person who is weak and hungry and weeping and reviled and spurned? Which of those two people is more likely to rely on themselves as the solution for, those, for their own problems? The first, the strong one, the one who has everything going for them. It's easy to look at our own success and say, in some measure or part, I did this. This is my good planning and my hard work coming to fruition. I deserve what I'm getting now. And yet, of those two people, obviously the person who will rely on Christ more, the person who will cry out to God, thankful for whatever gifts God can give them as they try to make it minute by minute and hour by hour through whatever circumstances face them. That's the person who's poor and hungry and weeping and reviled. All the way back in Jeremiah, it's pointed out for us in Scripture, the curse of self-reliance and the blessing of trust. And look at the images that Jeremiah used, picking up the images that David had spoken in Psalm chapter 1, previously to the, to the, uh, to the, prophet of, uh, the prophecy of Jeremiah. The man who relies on himself or woman, again, no gender point being made here, it's like a shrub out in the middle of the desert. Nothing else to draw from. Whatever strength it's going to have, it has to provide for itself. Is that a good plan? Would you plant a green bush in the middle of a desert? Not if you want it to live. Which one is blessed? The one that's planted by the stream of water. The one that is supplied from outside itself and has a steady source of supply. So that no matter the season and no matter the circumstances, that one knows it will have what it needs. That one will grow and will flourish. When we try to rely on ourselves, we become like that bush in the middle of a desert. I can do this all by myself. No, you can't. That's a pretty good way to end up crispy. On the other hand, when we acknowledge that we cannot do it by ourselves, we intentionally put ourselves close to a supply source. The supply source we're occupying right now where God's word can be poured out, God's word of forgiveness through the absolution, God's word of rebirth in baptism, God's word of refreshment and renewal and forgiveness in the bread and in the wine that are the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the endless supply. Have any of you ever tried to teach someone else something? Anything at all? You've been a coach, you've been a teacher, you've given lessons in something, you've raised kids. Any of the, any of the above, right? Any of those situations. Who tends to be easier to teach? The person who comes to you saying, I don't know how to do this, or the person who comes to you saying, I know how to do this. Who's more teachable? Any teacher, any coach, anyone who's ever given lessons will say, sometimes the most naturally talented people make the worst students because they always think that they know the way to do it. They always think that they've got this. And because they come at it from a position of pride, they're not very moldable, not very teachable. But the person who comes to you and says, I got no clue how this is supposed to work. Please, help me. They're willing to listen to whatever you have to say. They're willing to try whatever techniques you recommend that they try. So which one do you think Jesus wants us to be, individually or collectively, as his body? Do you think he wants people of strength who walk through those doors saying, God's lucky to have me on his team? I'm bringing a lot to this party, right? I got skills here. Let's put these to use, God. Of course not. The ones that he longs for are the ones who walk through those doors saying, God, unless you give it to me, I've got nothing. 
Unless you provide it to me, I've got no plan. Unless you feed me, I've got no way to be fed. I am relying on you 100%, God. That's what he wants. Does God want us to be weak? No. His long-term plan is to provide for all of our needs in eternity, perfectly. But as long as we're here on earth, we need to recognize that our hope lies elsewhere, somewhere other than this body and this mind and this will and this spirit and what I can try to cobble together or accomplish. That's going to come to naught. It always will, like that crispy bush in the desert. Instead, we need to find a source that can supply us far beyond this life. Paul even touches on it in regards to resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, 19, he says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. If we think that Christ is just around to help us have a happier life now, or to help us be better people now, now by the way, he can do those things. He is with us in every circumstance, and he does empower us to serve others. But if we think that's the whole menu, if we think that's the whole plan, just to make us have a comfortable and useful life here on earth, then we are of most people to be pitied. Because what Christ came is far bigger than that. He can't accomplish those things, and when he does, that is his grace to us, and we thank God for it. But his main plan, his primary purpose is much greater. Verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 15. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He didn't come so that we could have our best life now, to quote the title of a best selling scriptural, not very scriptural, spiritual book. He came so that we can have our best life in eternity and to help us do what we can in the present. Despite our weakness, despite our hunger, despite the fact that we are so frequently lacking in the things that we would love to have. So what do we do with all this? Well, first, we recognize that our strength can be just as much of a temptation as it can be a blessing. A temptation to rely on self and to then turn away from God. A temptation to say, I don't need your help, God. I'm in good shape here. And when we have that mindset, we can also recognize that even our persecutions, even our struggles, even our difficulties can bring blessings from God. I never like to slip into the language of saying that they are blessings. They're part of living in a fallen world, a fallen world that God is in the process of undoing and making a new one. Come to the Revelation class if you want more of that data. And yet, God can use those times of weakness to help us, instead of being like a crispy bush in the desert, to help us to know we need to be planted where we can be provided for. We need to be planted by His streams of living water. We need to be in His Word. We need to receive His sacraments. Not just once in a while, but every time they're offered. That's the only way we can grow, the only way we can thrive, the only way we can survive. It's understandable and even mature to try to strengthen what is weak. There's even Bible verses about that. And yet there's a beauty in recognizing that in our weakness, we see more perfectly his strength. One of my favorite writers of all time is G.K. Chesterton. He was a British theologian and philosopher, and he points out that when you're on a mountaintop, everything else looks small. It's only when you're in the valley that things can look majestic. And we recognize that about our own weakness as well. As long as we think we're big, strong, tough, and capable, we will never look at God with the awe and wonder and reliance that we ought to. But when we recognize that we are weak, it's then that we can realize that He is strong. And if that sounds kind of familiar, it is the lyric of a song you've probably known for a long time. Little ones to Him belong. They are weak. We are weak. He is strong. And it's in those moments of weakness that we learn, as difficult as it is, to rely more and more on Christ. And as we rely more and more on Him, what we learn is that He truly will supply all that we need. Day to day, minute to minute in this life, and with riches and abundance in the life yet to come. Does God want weakness in His body? You bet He does in the sense that he wants us to rely on him.
until the day that every weakness will be turned to strength, every sorrow will be turned to joy, and every promise will be fulfilled. And may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds firmly. In Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.